Have you ever noticed an interesting phenomenon like I have recently, that when you become familiar with something, there's a tendency to think that we know the thing and we quit looking at it closely? Like the other day I was sitting in my car, but instead of sitting in the driver's seat, I happened to sit in the passenger seat. And as I sat there, I happened to notice a button that if pressed, it would change the display screen for my car. It was a button I had never seen before. You guys, I've been driving this car for six years. Six years, how did I miss that? Well, I missed it because I had quit looking and I had become too familiar with my car from the view that I normally occupied it. It wasn't until I changed positions or context that I saw something new. Similarly, I was watching a TV show the other day where a man had been away from his wife for three months while he went and lived alone in the wilderness. When his wife came to visit him and he saw her again in that rugged new context, and he hadn't seen her for a while, the first words out of his mouth were, oh my, you're so, so beautiful. Like her beauty almost shocked him. Sometimes our familiarity with something blinds us to its actual reality. This phenomenon doesn't only happen with cars and with people, it also happens with scripture. We have read or heard a story many times and so we think we know the scriptural text. And maybe we do, but what we don't realize is that it can be seen another way or from another viewpoint. And in seeing it from that new angle, we begin to see it more clearly and some things emerge that we may have overlooked. Take our signature text of our faith, the Book of Mormon. We may know the Book of Mormon stories. We may be able to recall Book of Mormon characters. We may see Book of Mormon doctrines, but have we ever viewed the Book of Mormon through the position of theology? Well, that is what a team of a dozen scholars at the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship are doing right now, using theology to newly explore what the late Neil A. Maxwell called the Book of Mormon's divine architecture. The first volume in the series is on 1 Nephi, and BYU Religious Education's Joe Spencer wrote the book on it. The Book of Mormon, for all the attention it has gotten, has not gotten anything like the beginnings of the attention it deserves, and we have not even really begun to explore the book seriously. And yeah, theology is in some sense the least explored dimension. Um, the, we've, we've thought about the history, we've connected it to these various things, but this, yeah, these are the wings, these are the, yeah, the flaming fireplaces, et cetera, right, that we can still warm ourselves by that just have not yet appeared. In today's episode of Why Religion, get ready to explore some of the mansions of the Book of Mormon, its wings and flaming fireplaces by learning about and looking at it through the wide-angle lens of theology. I'm your host, Professor Anthony Sweat, and this is Why Religion. Each year, religion professors at Brigham Young University produce hundreds of publications on subjects related to The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This podcast brings this research into one place to enlighten the everyday seeker of truth. Seek learning even by study and also by faith. Interviewing the author, we discuss why the study was done, why it matters, and why the professor chooses to be both a scholar and a disciple. This is Why Religion, research to enlighten your mind. Recently, Professor Ryan Sharp from the Department of Ancient Scripture sat down with his fellow colleague from Ancient Scripture, Professor Joe Spencer, to talk about his role in the Neil A. Maxwell Institute series on the Book of Mormon Brief Theological Introduction Series, of which Joe has written the series' first publication on 1 Nephi, and he is also one of the editors for the series. In part one, Dr. Spencer will talk a little bit about the project as a whole, about the differences and definitions of theology compared to doctrine, and why theology can help us see the grandeur of the Book of Mormon. In part two, he will talk more specifically about his own book on 1 Nephi, how he approached it and why he approached it that way, with some wonderful insights and some great takeaways for us as listeners. And as always on part three, Professor Spencer will share a little bit about why he chose to be a BYU religion professor and why he chooses faith. So here is Dr. Joe Spencer being interviewed by his colleague, Ryan Sharp. All right, we're here to talk about the recent publication from the Maxwell Institute, the Book of Mormon, uh, Brief Theological Introductions. And I want to start with how this series came to be. 
um, and and maybe provide a, a, a little background. So my experience, I taught seminary for 10 years and have now been here at BYU for two years. In seminary, you often get to see the students connect with scripture for the first time. You get to see their eyes light up and find an initial excitement for the word of God. And it's been interesting here at BYU where most of our students have read the Book of Mormon for years. Many of them are returned missionaries who have been immersed in both studying and teaching the Book of Mormon. Since teaching here on campus, one of the questions I'm asked most often is, how can I get more out of my scripture study? Uh, They've hit this plateau and are craving ways to make their engagement with scripture more meaningful. In the introduction to the series, uh, it says, for some time, faithful scholars have explored the Book of Mormon's textual history, reception, historicity, literary quality, and more. This series focuses particularly on theology, the scholarly practice of exploring a scriptural text implications and its lens on God's work in the world. So I would love to hear, what was the genesis behind this project? How did it start? How did you become involved? Maybe tell us that story. Yeah. uh, I mean, I think there's kind of a twofold story here behind this. Uh, On the one hand, there's there's been a group of us theologians, uh, Adam Miller, Kimberly Berkey, Rosalind Welch, Jenny Webb, Jim Faulkner, myself, uh, who've been in conversation for, I mean, more than a decade trying to talk about theology and this kind of thing. At some point, we gave rise to an organization uh, once upon a time called the Mormon Theology Seminar, now the Latter-day Saint Theology Seminar, that, uh, that looks really carefully at scriptural texts theologically and began to try to create a discourse, uh, conversation about possibilities of reading theologically. Uh, and that created a space within which I think something like this series was possible and its value could be seen. But the second uh, and sort of more direct um, motivation was uh, Elder Holland came to BYU a couple of years ago and gave a talk uh, directed specifically to the Maxwell Institute and talked about the kinds of things he'd like to see happen and so on. And, uh, and it stirred up uh, various people at the Maxwell Institute to say, yeah, theology is probably the way to do this, to do the kinds of things Elder Holland is talking about. So they came to us and said, all right, you're the theologians. Tell us what we should do here. <laughs> so. so the next phase then, this group of scholars comes together and, and, and kind of a uniquely qualified uh, group of authors and editors to provide this fresh approach to the Book of Mormon. Uh, you mentioned a few of these names, obviously you, yourself. We've got Terrell Givens, Deidre Green, uh, Sharon Harris, James Faulkner, Kylie Nielsen Turley, Mark Rathel, Kim Berkey, Daniel Becerra, Adam Miller, uh, Rosalind Welch, and David Holland. And so you bring these, uh, these, these brilliant thinkers together with degrees in philosophy, comparative literature, uh, religion, English, uh, international area studies, American studies, uh, theology, early Christianity, early English literature and history. And so you bring all of these resources together. I just love maybe a peek behind the curtain. What was it like working with this group? What did you learn from this? Are there any stories that stand out to you as this project unfolded? I mean, there's been a lot of push and pull and the, the, as we're trying to figure out what it looks like to do theology with scripture. Uh, there are different visions, right? So Terrell Givens, for instance, thinks of theology in a very different way from Jim Faulkner. Uh, They come from very different intellectual backgrounds. Or Mark Rathall thinks of it very differently uh, than, say, Deidre Green. Um, So we have uh, a wide variety of perspectives on a field that's just emerging. And so it has been, uh, I'll say intense, never unfriendly, but intense as we're trying to sort out what this looks like. Yeah, wonderful thoughts. Throughout this discussion, you know, you've mentioned theology several times. The the series is called a brief theological introduction. So maybe just a, a couple of of questions. First of all, can you help us understand some distinction between theology and doctrine? Yeah. Because as as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, the word theology isn't used very often, and when it is, it's usually used as synonymous with doctrine. Uh, help us understand what what you're saying and what you're meaning when you talk about theology. That's great. Um, There are a lot of ways you can carve these up. And it's worth saying that uh, we don't quite know what theology will have been yet. Uh, This is a kind of new field for Latter-day Saints. And uh, and when I say new, I mean like 
very new. And so we'll sort of see how this plays out and how different people define it over time. That said, uh, the definition that I like the most or the way I like to carve these up the best is to recognize that doctrine is, as we understand it, a kind of authoritative thing, right? Doctrine is official. It's something that the leaders of the church decide and promulgate, and we're bound to it as believing Latter-day Saints. Theology has no authority whatsoever. Theology is a kind of speculative, but not wild, right? Responsible, but speculative endeavor. What if we read this text through this lens? What if we tried to let this text tell us about this issue we face? Uh, what, if we, what if we allowed this text to show us the way to make sense of these problems? Um, and then read the text really carefully and see what comes out. That's very different from doctrine where you're looking for principles yeah. that are eternal and unchanging, and, um, and, and especially you're trying to make sure you know what the, the official yeah. claims of the church are, right? So, so let me, uh, let's play around with this for just a second. So, so what would you say in response to somebody who throws out, you know, what are these academics doing about, doing, talking about theology and doctrine, like they're the authority on it? Yeah. Yeah. And we'll hear that, uh, that question now and again, but, uh, yeah, my response is just to say something like nothing we're saying gets anywhere close to doctrine, right? Uh, it's just got a different set of questions. So for example, one of, one of the chapters in my own book is on, uh, how do we make sense of Laban's death, right? There simply isn't the doctrine, about that, there just isn't. It would be a very strange thing if there were, uh, if we had a kind of official doctrinal account. This is the church's official stance on Nephi slaying Yeah, Laban. that would be a very strange thing. This is a thing that requires theology. Now, if we said, okay, now let's theologize you know, some, something for which there is a specific doctrine, right? That God is the Father, Jesus is the Son. Uh, yeah, now we might be on weird territory, right? Telling people, this is how you must think of the Father. This is how you must think of the Son. That would be another story. But, but yeah, the kinds of questions we're asking just don't, don't, I think, work in the same field. But it's interesting, and it's interesting you use that example because you, you, you get some theology in Mosiah 15, you know, where you're looking at this statement on the, the Father and the Son and the, the doctrine is the father and the son are distinct personages, resurrected, et cetera. But that's not really what Abinadi is getting at, right? That's right, yeah. Yeah, so the doctrine, I mean, the official doctrine, right, is, is laid out in a first presidency statement from the early 20th century. Uh, that's the doctrine. Uh, to read Abinadi and to read him theologically there would not be to say, okay, so now what is the official doctrine of the church on who the father is, who the son is, or something like that? It would be to say, what is Abinadi doing and how can it speak to whatever it is we're trying to think about? Yeah. And as I read Mosiah 15, I mean, we were, I was actually part of a project a couple of years ago doing theological readings of Mosiah 15. And the question was, what does this text tell us about what it means to submit? Yeah. And that's really what the father-son stuff seems to be doing for Abinadi theologically. Yeah, talking about Christ, uh, the, the, the flesh, the mortal side, submitting to the divine and the father. And Precisely. Uh, I, I think it's a beautiful thought. Let me just read a, a, one more passage from this uh, introduction that I think is, is underscoring the points that you're making here. So it says, this series focuses particularly on theology, the scholarly practice of exploring the scriptural text implications and its lens on God's work in the world. Series volumes invite Latter-day Saints to discover additional dimensions of this treasured text, but leave to prophets and apostles their unique role of declaring its definitive official doctrines. In this case, theology, as opposed to authoritative doctrine, relates to the original sense of the term as literally reasoned God talk. The word also designates a well-developed academic field, but it is the more general sense of the term that most often applies here. So I'd love you to make a case for a theological approach to the Book of Mormon. So our, our listeners, many of whom have studied the Book of Mormon for years, some uh, are, are probably new converts, maybe some who aren't members and, and, uh, and the Book of Mormon is, is new to them altogether. What would you say are some of the strongest cases for approaching the text theologically? Uh, the strongest case I think I would want to make would be um, to say that it's in asking theological questions that we start to get to the rest of the text. So if I'm reading, just take 1 Nephi 1 as a simple example. 
text everyone's read 10 million times. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got uh, various stories. Stories don't take long to get clear. You've got all kinds of interesting connections to prophetic visions of the throne and so on. You can connect this to Ezekiel and Isaiah and Revelation. Good. That doesn't take terribly long. Um, what doctrines do we have here? Well, a few doctrines about, say, who God is, uh, what a prophet is, that kind of a thing. Now what, <laughs> right? And what about the rest of the verses? And what about the rest of the content? How do we think about uh, the various images? How do we think about uh, the fact that Lehi ends up mocked for one message and almost murdered for a different message? How do we, these are all theological questions, right? So it's to ask the other questions that remain. And I think, uh, as you described, you get uh, a kind of pattern of Latter-day Saints having read the book a few times and then kind of feeling like, well, I kind of got it, right? <laughs> like, I got the message. Uh, I know the stories and I know the doctrines. So now what? This is the rest. And, uh, and it's, it takes work and it's a different kind of style of reading. But it brings out all the rest of the text and the force that I think it really has. If you're interested in more peer-reviewed, high-quality gospel scholarship about Latter-day Saint history, doctrine, or practice, such as this publication, BOU's Religious Studies Center is a great place to check out. Today, I want to bring your attention to a new volume that has just been published by the RSC from the 49th Annual Sidney B. Sperry Symposium called How and What You Worship, Christology and Praxis in the Revelations of Joseph Smith, edited by Rachel Cope, Carter Charles, and Jordan T. Watkins. This volume brings together the brilliant writings of over a dozen religion scholars surrounding the seminal revelatory text about Christ and our divine nature found in Doctrine and Covenants 93. This volume seeks to understand Christ as revealed in the revelations of Joseph Smith and to clarify the practices required of those who worship a being who grew, quote, from grace to grace, end of quote. These essays explore broadly the nature of Jesus and how we're to follow him. Chapters expand on topics such as how Christ includes and empowers women, to nonviolence as Christian worship, to terminology about theosis and deification. Its content won't disappoint, and it will help expand your own vision of the Latter-day Saint faith and the Savior whom we worship. Again, the book is called How and What You Worship, Christology and Praxis in the Revelations of Joseph Smith. Check it out and pick it up at rsc.byu.edu. We've been listening to Joe Spencer talk about his work on the Neil A. Maxwell Institute series on the Book of Mormon, Brief Theological Introductions. For this part of Why Religion, in part two, Professor Spencer gets more specific into 1 Nephi and his own analysis of the text, providing some insightful points and potential applications for us as listeners. So here's Ryan Sharp continuing his interview with Dr. Spencer. In, in this next segment, we usually spend time focusing on how a particular study or article or book can help Latter-day Saints in their own study of Scripture and their own discipleship. So, so far in this interview, we've looked primarily at the broader project of the book series. Uh, I want to spend the next several minutes on the book that you wrote on First Nephi. Um, obviously, we could spend a few hours unpacking the great work you've done. In fact, I should note here that you did a podcast interview with the Maxwell Institute focused specifically on your book where I, I think... Uh, our listeners would probably be interested in, in learning more about your particular study. Um, but I want to use this time as maybe a case study. You mentioned, you know, First Nephi. First Nephi, you know, 1 verse 1 is probably the most oft-read verse of Scripture. And First Nephi is probably the most oft-read book for members of the church. And, and as you alluded to, uh, our, our students and, and members of the church often feel like, I, I kind of got what's going on there. What's next? Um, so what I'd love to do is you've made a case for theology. I, I think we understand the significance of it, the value of it. So let's, let's maybe practice. Maybe So you, you're the teacher, we're the students. Uh, walk us through a, a, a few of the approaches that you took in First Nephi, and, and you can take this whichever direction you want. Um, you provided several fascinating insights in this book. Walk us through the thought process. Where did it begin? What was the next step? I, I want us to really try to see what it looks like to study the Book of Mormon through this theological lens. Yeah. So for me, well, I should say just at the broadest level, 
uh, the way I, I wrote the book, I divided into two halves, and one half is asking, what is Nephi's own theological project? What are the things he's thinking about? And the second half, I say, now what are the questions we tend to have? So let me, let me already stop you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So how do you know what Nephi's theological, like what, what are the signposts? What, what points that out to you? Good, yeah. So this is what I was uh, going to say, actually. So for me, at least, uh, if we want to get at what the actual theological interests of a volume of scripture, a figure in scripture, et cetera, are, I think the only way to get there is to figure out structure and flow of ideas. So the way I get there in looking at First Nephi is to say, how is this thing organized? Because if it's got an organization, we can say, okay, we can say something about what Nephi was doing. If you want to think about uh, what some planners of an event were really trying to make happen, you look at how the event unfolded, who spoke first and who spoke last and what happened in between and what did the posters on the wall look like or whatever, right? You start to think about structure and organization and it tells you something about intent and interests and purposes. Uh, and I think we can very clearly assume that Nephi is intentional, deliberate about this. And especially because he uses the phrase several times, the fullness of mine intent is, and, and he gives us some of those signposts. Yeah, he's in fact often signposts, yeah. way more than say Mormon ever does, yeah. right? So uh, yeah, so and if we can discern structure and so on, then I think we can actually get to theological intent. I think we can do this all through the Book of Mormon. Yeah. So take us through a, a few examples. Maybe some of your, maybe it's like trying to ask which of your children are your favorite. <laughs> um, but but what are a, a few of your favorite insights that have come from this, and how did you how did you land on these? Yeah, well, let me give uh, one that I think uh, brings people up short most often, and that is that. So when you see the structure of First Nephi, you start to see that uh, the dream of the tree of life from Lehi uh, is supposed to be not only uh, sort of expanded and unpacked in Nephi's own vision, I think most people recognize that, but it's also supposed to be set side by side with Isaiah from the brass plates and that these are supposed to be read together uh, so that the two sort of inform each other or help clarify each other. And, and what, uh, what led to that thinking? Uh, is the structure, yeah, just seeing the structure uh, because Nephi, I think, actually very carefully sets these... Uh, Side by side. I don't know, did you want me to unpack this structure? I, I would love it, yeah. Yeah. So the basic structure, he divides the he divides the first Nephi into two halves. He's very explicit about that. A first half that's the abridgment of his father's record, and a second half that's his own proceedings, as he calls them. So the first half is first Nephi one through nine. The second half is first Nephi ten through twenty-two. Uh, and if you look at original chapter breaks, and there's a whole lot to say about that, but if you look at original chapter breaks, the first half of First Nephi is originally just two chapters. So just two stories about Lehi and abridgment. I'm, I'm going to be annoying and pause you again. Yeah. So for our listeners, original chapter breaks, maybe just spend a, a minute or two unpacking that. Yeah, and sure. We'll get back to your, okay, yeah, sure. your structure. Um, so when Joseph Smith dictates the text of the Book of Mormon to his scribes, he dictates chapter breaks as part of the text, but they're not the chapter breaks we have in today's current edition that we use officially. Uh, Orson Pratt in the 1870s is given the task of putting out a new edition of the Book of Mormon and making it a whole lot more usable. And so he divides- With shorter chapters. Exactly, and... divides the chapters into shorter lengths and adds verse numbers and a lot of footnotes and chapter headings and all these kinds of things. So we have shorter chapters today, but those original chapters are part of the text. I think you can actually show that, though it would take more time than we probably want to spend here. But you can show that these are original. And if you start to look at the original chapters of First Nephi, they organize the text beautifully. So yeah, the original chapters of the first half of First Nephi, just two. The original chapter one is now First Nephi one through five. The original chapter two is now First Nephi six through nine. Occasionally I'll have students go, oh, why did Orson Pratt change these? Doesn't that ruin the text? And the answer is, imagine family scripture study at 5 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> if you had to read all of First Nephi one through five. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you. Uh, so back to, the, back to the structure that yeah. you were talking about. So yeah, so you've got two stories that Nephi is telling about his father then, those two original chapters in that first half. One story is getting the brass plates from Jerusalem. The other story is this dream that his father has. Uh, and so just these two stories, these two sources, if you will, uh, of prophetic content, a, a, a scriptural old world book they can carry with them, and then this new living, breathing prophecy that Lehi has. Uh, the second half of First Nephi, where Nephi is now giving us his own proceedings, 
it's a lot more complicated. There are five original chapters and so on. But if you look at them carefully, it's very clear that two of those chapters are unpacking the dream and two of those chapters are unpacking the plates. You get the long quotation of Isaiah at the end of First Nephi along with an explanation. And then at the early part of that, First Nephi 10 and onward, you get him, uh, Nephi having the dream himself, having the vision and then explaining it. In 15, you get the explanation. Exactly. Uh, what you have happening over the course of First Nephi is here are these two sources and where we got them. There's the abridgment of Lehi's record. But then in Nephi's own proceedings and his ministry, he starts to unpack these two sources side by side. And uh, his word for this seems to be likening. You can liken Isaiah's prophecies to this vision. You can liken the vision to Isaiah's prophecies. And now you can see what God is doing in Israel. Yeah, brilliant. I love that. And I, I, I think it's such a, such a fresh approach and helps you draw those parallels uh, more cleanly. Yeah. Um, maybe another example from, from your book. Is there another one that, uh, that stood out to you? Yeah, let me uh, sort of narrow in from there to one that's kind of connected. But I think if once you see this sort of overarching structure and the fact that Isaiah and the vision, the dream are supposed to be read side by side, then I think actually Lehi's dream itself becomes very different. And so one of the things uh, I enjoy talking about a great deal and I cover in the book is uh, if you read the structure of the, of the account of Lehi's dream and you read it in light of these larger themes that Nephi is developing, then all these multitudes that are grabbing the rod and going on the path and all this stuff probably aren't supposed to be like every one of us working our way through the plan of salvation to find Christ. It's probably supposed to be Laman and Lemuel's children, very specifically. Uh, and that what Lehi is seeing here is precisely the fact that once Laman and Lemuel don't eat of the tree, their children are wandering and lost. And the only way they're gonna find their way back is by finding this rod, this word of God, the Book of Mormon that comes forth in the last days that if they grab hold of, will lead them back to a knowledge of their Redeemer and, uh, and be the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. So this dream that we tend to read as um, a kind of story of every man's struggle to find Christ may actually be a kind of historical account, uh, prophetically, of what it's going to be for the Lamanites, the children of Lehi in the last days to be restored to their place in the covenant. Conscious that several times it... Uh, both Nephi and others talk about this record coming forth to the Lamanites yep. and they're going to receive this and this is what's going to uh, reconnect them with the covenant. Exactly, yeah. When Nephi has his own version of the dream, that's the center, right? Yeah. This book that's got to be sealed and come forth and it's going to bring these covenant people back. And so what would you say to a reader of the Book of Mormon who says, I love reading the Book of Mormon and finding myself in this vision and where am I at and am I at the tree or am I wandering off? You know, if, if this is what Nephi were intending, what's your response there? Well, I think uh, I'd say two things. I'm, one, I, would, I wanna say, if you're feeling the spirit, hallelujah, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> like, why are you wasting your time with me, yeah. right? Um, <laughs> but two, uh, I would say, I think it's actually very important that Nephi when he recounts the dream of the tree of life, uh, he could have just skipped to the second half of the book, right? He could have just said, my father had a dream, but I'm gonna tell you what it really means and not tell us the dream. But he does give us the dream. And the dream, you could say, scrubs the details, right? Yeah. And I think that's deliberate. There's a certain sense in which the way Nephi recounts the dream is supposed to invite broader reflection. Now it's sort of primary meaning, I think, right? As I read the text and try to sort this out, I think it's primary meaning is about the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. But you'd better believe that the way of telling it also opens it to these yeah. other possibilities. And shouldn't I also see in the history of Israel myself, right? Yeah. The breaking up of the bread and the scattering it across the congregation and the gathering together again as we drink the fruit of the vine with Christ at the last day. Like the, that's the gathering, the scattering and gathering of Israel and it's my sacramental experience, right? Um, or the gathering of Israel is very much my own, having been alienated and lost, and I will find my way back to Christ. So yeah, it's history. And yeah, it's me. Yeah, and, and that's why I wanted to push you on a little bit, because I think sometimes we draw this false dichotomy. And I think sometimes that gets in the way of our own engagement with the text. And, and I, I love your response there. Um, maybe just one more thing from, from your book. 
So you talk about Laman and Lemuel, and you talk about Nephi's relationship with Laman and Lemuel. Uh, there are a number of directions that you could take this, but what are some of the things that, st- that have stood out to you both in this project? And I know you've spent a lot of time on, on uh, these relationships and other, other projects you've worked on as well, but uh, what, what would you say about Nephi and his relationship with Laman and Lemuel? Good, yeah. Uh, so I, in my view, there are sort of two common views of Nephi and his brothers. So there's a kind of, I think what's often described as a naive view. I don't know if it's really that naive, uh, but a naive view where Nephi is the obviously great kid and Laman and Lemuel are the scumbag brothers, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and then there's a kind of not quite as naive, but I think is still maybe even more naive view in some ways where Nephi is the obnoxious um, Arrogant. It always thinks he's better than them. Yeah, exactly. And, and Layman and Lemuel are kind of the, the kids who get it, right? Yeah. They're kind of more mature and so on. Um, but these seem to be the two views I, I come across again and again. But what I what I see happening in the book of uh, in the first book of Nephi, as you read it carefully, is exactly um, neither of these, right? Nephi is a much more nuanced and complex character, and Layman and Lemuel are much more nuanced and complex characters. Uh, they're not just sort of simply murderous, wayward, so on. Yeah. They're complicated uh, figures who have understandable positions and who haven't been given the gifts that Nephi has been given, and Nephi has a hard time getting his head around that. And then Nephi is someone who presents himself, and this is what I argue in the book, presents himself as overzealous at times, uh, prone to a certain kind of over-the-top demonstration of his faith and God has to keep telling him, let me break the, ba- the, the bands that are, that are binding me now and then they were loosed. And then God's like, eh, cute, yeah. nice try Nephi. Let's yeah. just loose those off you. Yeah. Exactly, and I, the, you have a whole series of these kinds of experiences. So I think Nephi's trying to tell us, I was, I was a little bit of a hotshot and that may have caused long-term damage to my relationship with my brothers. Because he's writing this 30 something years after the fact. Exactly, right? yeah. And I think, and I think you do a great job of capturing this in your book. But but I think this makes Nephi more real, because of all figures in Scripture, uh, Nephi seems the most kind of unapproachable because he does seem like he's always uh, doing the right thing and he's always perfectly in line. And imperfect people like me have a hard time connecting with that, which is why Second Nephi four, you know, is, is one of my favorites because Nephi sort of opens up his soul and and lets you see what he's struggling with. But I think you do a good job of showing that in First Nephi, he's already showing his humanity. He's already showing uh, his imperfections. Yeah. And one of the things that strikes me the most here, I mean, it's no mystery, and I have a whole chapter on sort of what I think is going on here, but it's no mystery to anyone reading the Book of Mormon today that women fare badly in this book, right? That they're largely absent, largely silent, and that there are a lot of stories of abuse and violence and all kinds of things like this running through the book. And that's a hard thing to get our heads around um, in various ways. And I have things to say about that in the book. But one of the things that's most striking about Laman and Lemuel in First Nephi is that they are clearly attuned to the suffering of the women in a way that Nephi himself doesn't seem to be. And Nephi doesn't shy away from letting that be seen. And that is, I think, really striking. Because uh, he could have left it out. Yeah. He could have changed the narrative. Yeah, he could have made them violent abusers or something yeah. like that. But no, he he illustrates their care for the suffering of the women uh, in a way we never see him exhibit. And that's, I think, really striking. He sees something in them that he doesn't himself feel or doesn't quite reach or something like that, but he can recognize. Yeah, I, I love that. Um I, I want to read one more excerpt here and kind of give you an opportunity to share any final thoughts on either your particular book or the the broader project. And and I have to say, I, I was, and I, I mentioned this to you in the hallway after I read your book, but I, I was moved uh, by your your conclusion and, and some of your thoughts and feelings as you uh, as you ended this this book. So this is what you say as, as part of your conclusion. Disarmingly human, but extraordinary, extraordinarily gifted with prophecy, this is the Nephi I'd follow into the desert. In fact, it's the Nephi I have followed into the desert. I've traveled with Nephi, as it were, to where he stood when the Spirit swept him away to witness the history of his people. I've sat by the seaside with him as he's told me about his struggles with his brothers. 
I followed him into the wilderness of Isaiah's writings and learned as he's taught me to read them. The Nephi who lived through some experiences I'm grateful never to have had and whose other experiences I hope I can and will have someday. The Nephi who then took decades to reflect on these experiences and several years more to give them shape that could speak to me. I love this Nephi. He's taught me more than any other source the meaning of the restoration. He was the first to show me my real place in history. What an angelic guide once was to Nephi, Nephi was himself Nephi has himself been to me. I don't know the meaning of all things, but Nephi has made me feel God's love for his children in ways I couldn't have experienced without him. That's such a beautiful uh, beautiful comment. Any, any final words on what this project has meant to you and, and, uh, and anything else you would share with our listeners? Yeah, that is beautiful. I'm that really, is. Did I write that? <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe I just needed to hear you read it. Um, Nephi is remarkable. Uh, he is, uh, he's quite a figure. And, uh, and so much more obsessed with things that we tend to want to avoid then makes us comfortable, right? Isaiah and this complex history of prophecy and so on. Um, but my goodness, let him, let him teach us. And we'll, I think, finally understand where we're at. Uh, I, I say in that passage that Nephi finally, it was the first person who really taught me my place in the restoration. And what I mean by that is he's the one that taught me that from the Book of Mormon's perspective, I'm a Gentile, right? And that means that I have to seek to be numbered among the house of Israel by seeking out those who have been lost. Not that I'm just sort of comfortably ensconced and waiting for all the blessings that are promised me. And, uh, and I couldn't be more grateful for that. It's the thing that woke me up to the work that has to be done. If you're interested in reading Professor Spencer's brief theological book on 1 Nephi, we've included a link to it at whyreligion.byu.edu. There, we've also included a link to the Maxwell Institute's great podcasts where they interview authors from the series about the books they've written on the Book of Mormon. And remember that if you want to connect with us at Why Religion, comment and give your insights on episodes you've listened to, or see behind-the-scenes photos and get some bonus material, follow us on Instagram at Why Religion Podcast. All right, we've arrived at part three of Why Religion, our final segment, where we like to talk to the professor a little bit more personally about why the professor chose to be a religious educator, why they believe, and why they choose faith. So we wrap up this episode with Professor Joe Spencer sharing a little bit about those questions. In this last section, we're going to get a little bit more personal, but hopefully not uncomfortably personal, (laughs) um, and and talk about you, about your background, your education, what led you to religious education. So, So let's start. Give us a little bit of background about your academic training, where you studied, what you studied, and why you decided to, uh, to go down those paths. Yeah, my wife likes to say we're on plan G. <laughs> <laughs> or H, maybe, or I, <laughs> anyway, somewhere in there. Uh, yeah, my plan, I came to BYU as an undergrad to study music, realized I had no talent, and then had to figure out what to do with myself. That's a tough realization. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, and so I thought I'd do business, and then I hated every second of that. Uh, but I discovered philosophy in an economics class. Uh, So I decided to study philosophy. My plan was to teach seminary. Uh, What came back from my mission, fired up about that possibility. Spent two weeks teaching in a classroom in Lehigh. uh, And I thought, I don't want to do this. Due respect to people in (laughs) Lehigh, of course. (laughs) Of course, of course. But (laughs) oh my goodness. And I I, I learned later that I had a particularly challenging classroom. But uh, uh, so then I thought, well, now what do I do? So uh, I sort of floundered for a couple of years trying to figure out where to go. Um, I opened a small bookstore for a while, independent bookstore. And uh, when that didn't pan out, I uh, went and did a master's in library science, thinking I'd stay in the book world, Uh, emphasized archiving. And then as I was wrapping that up, had an opportunity to teach philosophy at Utah Valley University for a year and just thought, this is what I want to do. So then I decided to pursue uh, graduate degrees in philosophy and did... Uh, master's and a PhD. My plan was not to teach in religious education. Uh, my plan was to uh, was to be a philosopher uh, wherever the job market took me. But uh, but I was working all through those years from undergraduate on. I was working on the Book of Mormon and Latter Day Saint theology and that kind of thing. And so that opened some doors here in religious ed. Uh, someone here approached me 
uh, about some of the work I had published and said, would you be interested? And I said, what? <laughs> uh, like not knowing that was a possibility? Or? Yeah, I, if you had asked me if that was a possibility, I would have said no, <laughs> like not remotely. Um, and they said, no, I think this is something that might might be of interest to you and you of interest to us. And I, well, So I came out and taught for a summer and just thought, if I could do this for the rest of my life. And what, what was it about it that was kind of magical for you? Teaching the Book of Mormon, just that simple, yeah. right? I mean, for me, it's research on my feet, trying to riddle through these texts out loud with really amazing students who are earnest and honest and want to sort this out and be better people in light of it. And there's, there's nothing like that in the world. And so you get to do everything. You get yeah. to do your work in philosophy. You get to do your work in, in uh, the Book of Mormon. And yep. Yeah. So that's, yeah, it's been a weird road to get here, and it was not at all what I expected, but here we are. The last question I want to ask is, you know, sometimes when we, when we dig in to uh, scriptural studies, uh, historicity, the, these sorts of things, um, sometimes it, it can negatively affect the faith of the reader and the faith of the believer. So as someone who has who has read probably more books than anyone I know, I sometimes joke with Joe that I worry about him because he walks across campus uh, holding his book and with his with his face buried in his book, and I'm worried he's going to wander in front of a car or a bike or something like that. Um, so you, you you've read all of these books, you've read all of these arguments, you you're familiar with with all of these things. I'm guessing that there aren't many uh, criticisms against the Book of Mormon or or the church that you probably aren't familiar with. So what roots you in the restoration? Like, what, why do you believe? For me, um, academic pursuits, scholarly interest, and so on came after my love for the Book of Mormon and my testimony of it. Uh, I, didn't, uh, I wasn't on a long quest to find out if it was true. I found out it was true and then went on a quest to understand. Um, sometimes you'll hear that old line from... St. Anselm, right? Faith seeking understanding, fides quirens intellectum. Uh, and that's what it really has been for me. Um, so, and, and I should add to that, part of studying philosophy is to realize just how shoddy so much reasoning is. So having studied philosophy and then going out and studying all of what's been said about the history of the church or about the texts, the scriptures, et cetera, um, all the arguments against it have problems, right? So it was, it's been easy for me to go, well, nothing decides against it and nothing decides for it officially except the experiences I've had. And so that's where I remain rooted. Um, I've never had a kind of faith crisis per se uh, because the truth was born into me early on and really deeply. For me, it's a question of sorting out the implications uh, of its truth. And so I remain a believer simply because I can't undo what I've felt and what I've experienced. And also, I mean, not just a couple of singular experiences, right? An ongoing kind of crescendo-like uh, depth and, and force of the spirit. Uh, I can't shake that. And the more work I do, the more intellectual effort I give to it, the more it comes out on top. But I don't mean that by any secular measure. I don't think it could. Uh, I mean that in the sense of its depth and power and force, and that's what keeps me moving. Thank you for listening to Why Religion. This podcast is a production of religious education at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. My name is Anthony Sweat. I'm the executive producer. The Why Religion podcast team also includes from Brigham Young University, professors Brad Wilcox, Casey Griffiths, and Ryan Sharp. Recording and mixing were done by BYU students Mitchell Bashford and Connor Miller. Say hi, Mitchell and Connor. Hi, hey guys. Hi. Original music and scoring for Why Religion podcast was created by the fabulous BOU student musicians Grant Cagle, Sam Clausen, Colette Jones, and Alistair Scheuermann. If you enjoy what you've heard, please like and subscribe to Why Religion on wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a rating. It really helps. And join us next time as we continue to bring the everyday Latter-day Saint fascinating gospel studies done by Brigham Young University religion professors to enlighten your mind and strengthen your faith.